It wasn't just that the Orioles lost the game and were shut out by the Guardians on Monday afternoon. It's that they may have lost their center fielder for a bit as well, as Cedric Mullins left the game in the eighth with a groin injury. I'll recap the Orioles' tough loss, plus talk about what's next for the O's in center field without Cedric. Coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Tuesday, May 30th, 2023, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, we are going to recap a tough Orioles loss as they were shut out by the Guardians. 5-0 on Monday in the first of a three-game set. I'll get you the five things you need to know from that one, including a good start from Tyler Wells, the offense just disappearing, and a tough seventh inning for Orioles pitching and defense. Then we'll get to the even more unfortunate news of the day. Cedric Mullins leaving the game in the eighth inning with a groin injury. It looks like it's going to be an IL appearance at the very least for Cedric. We'll talk about what the injury is and how long he could be out and then get into who could replace him as he's been one of the best Orioles so far in 2023. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked on Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs, they've got the most comfortable shorts and pants out there. So head to birddogs.com, type in the promo code locked on MLB, get your shorts, get your pants, and get yourself a free Yeti style tumbler as well. So we kick things off today Orioles and Guardians, the first game of a three game set in Baltimore as the Guardians win it 5 0 over the O's to take game one of the series. First time this season that the Orioles have lost back to back series openers after losing 12 2 on Friday night in game one against the Rangers. And this was a tough loss for the O's. They've now lost three out of four. They lose it 5 0. Luckily, the Rays did lose 1-0 to the Cubs on Monday afternoon as well, but the day game loss for the Orioles sets them back to 34-20 and on the season, still four games back of Tampa Bay in the division. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles' 5-0 loss to Cleveland. And the first thing you need to know is the offense, once again, just got absolutely nothing going in this game. And it's been kind of a struggle lately for the Orioles offense, but even then they've at least scored a couple of runs in the last few games and they did enough to win with three runs on Sunday. They scored three runs back on Thursday in New York, won that game as well. If you don't score at all, I guarantee you, you will not win any games. That's what happened to the Orioles on Monday afternoon. Just two extra base hits on the day for the O's, just five hits total. They were dominated by the Guardians rookie lefty Logan Allen, who had the best start of his career. Now, granted, Allen, one of the top pitching prospects in the Guardian system, and has really good stuff, but he goes seven strong scoreless innings, three hits, 10 Ks, and two walks. Just had the Orioles offense flummoxed all day, and they just didn't do anything at all. I mean, a shout out to Anthony Santander, who had a three for four with a double and two singles and three hard hit balls, but he was the only guy with a multi-hit game. I mean, it was only Ryan Mountcastle with a single and James McCann with a double that were the Orioles' only other two hits. Cedric Mullins drew two walks in this game, but those were the only two walks for the Orioles as you oppose that to the 12 times that they struck out in this one. Just a bad offensive performance, and it has kind of continued what's been going on over the past five games, actually since the Orioles had that huge comeback, that eight-run seventh inning in New York against the Yankees on Wednesday night, the Orioles have just 11 runs in their last 46 innings since that eight-run inning. They had eight runs in one inning and then 11 runs in the next 46, kind of capped off by this shutout here today. The Guardians can't really hit, but you know they can pitch. Usually, generally only have to score a few runs to beat this team but the O's just couldn't do it at all on Monday afternoon. Second thing you need to know from this one, maybe one reason the Orioles offense didn't get it going is Adley Rutschman had his first full day off of the season. He got a few of these early last year after he got called up in mid-May, but it took until game number 54 of the year for Adley Rutschman to receive his first day off right at the one-third mark 
of the season and Adley gets the day off here. Now, he could have come into this game when the game ended on an Adam Frazier ground out with two on and two out in the bottom of the ninth. Adley was standing in the on-deck circle ready to pinch hit for Ryan McKenna. He would not have represented the tying run, but he would have been up with the tying run standing on deck at that point. So there was a chance for him to get in this game. He did not. And Brandon Hyde said before the game he wanted to give Adley a full day off because he hadn't had one all year. He's a catcher. You need full days off, especially early in the season, so the O's can use Adley more late. They have played Adley Rutschman much more this year than they did, especially early last year. He deserved the day off. Listen, would he have given better at-bats than James McCann? Yeah, he would have. McCann also had a double in this game, and basically nobody else did anything and quite frankly, I don't know how much four Adley plate appearances would have really changed the entire scope of how the O's did in this game. They were horrendous offensively in this one. Third thing you need to know as we switch over to the pitching side, really the one positive out of this game is Tyler Wells had another great start for the Orioles. Wells goes six innings, allowing just one run on four hits. He struck out seven and did not walk anyone through 101 pitches. He was nibbling a little bit against this Guardians order. That was one shy of his career high of 102, but he lowers his ERA to 3.29 on the year. He allowed just two hard hit balls in six innings of work. The stuff was tremendous from Tyler Wells in this game. Really the only guy he couldn't get was Will Brennan, who doubled twice against Wells, had a three-for-four day for the Guardians, and Brennan was the one who scored the only run against Tyler Wells. He doubled the lead off the fifth, then Wells balked that got him to third, and then Cam Gallagher came through with a sack fly to put Cleveland up one nothing in the top of the fifth inning, and that was really it against Tyler Wells. He really settled in in this game. Again, seven strikeouts, as I mentioned. He had 18 whiffs on 52 swings. Pretty nice number, and listen, 10 whiffs on his four-seam fastball led the way once again. That pitch throwing it up in the zone, above the zone. Basically, all he had to do against Josh Naylor, the Guardians' number four hitter, is just throw high fastballs, and Naylor basically chased every single one. That worked out for Wells as well. But four whiffs on the changeup. The cutter was solid today. The slider, he had a little bit of an issue with slider command. He was trying to get that thing near the outside corner to righties and was just running it off the plate a little too much where the Guardians wouldn't chase. But other than that, I thought the stuff was really amazing from Tyler Wells, that makes it now four straight starts for Wells with at least seven strikeouts. He became just the third Oriole ever to do that, to have at least four straight starts with seven or more strikeouts. Shout out to Nathan Ruiz of the Baltimore Sun who tweeted out this fact. The only other Orioles to do it were Connie Johnson, who did it eight times in a row in 1957, the fourth year of existence for the Orioles, and then Eric Bedard, who did it five times in a row back in 2007, Wells will try to catch Bedard in his next start. Fourth thing you need to know from this one is that things kind of unraveled for the Orioles in the seventh inning of this game. Now, it was a 5 nothing loss, but they trailed one nothing through 6 and then gave up a 4 spot in the top of the seventh. Now, CNL Perez was the pitcher. He relieved Wells and came in to start that seventh inning. And yes, most of the runs are charged to him. He only recorded one out, allowed four runs. Two of them earned on four hits. Only through 10 pitches and somehow found a way to face five batters and give up four hits. But it wasn't exactly all his fault. It's not like it was a terrible outing. I mean, he only gave up one hard hit ball out of the five that were put in play against him. It was really just bad luck for CNL Perez in that seventh inning. He comes into the game, faces Andres Jimenez, gets him to ground out to start the inning. Then Miles Straw hits the biggest Baltimore chop of all time a negative 65-degree launch angle, basically beats it straight into the ground. And because it was Straw, one of the fastest runners in baseball, he barely beats the throw. Then Will Brennan just kind of pulls a ball. You know, He was the only hard-hit ball at, at 100 miles an hour, but chopped it right into the ground, just got it into right field for a base hit. Then Cam Gallagher kind of dribbled one into the outfield. Then Stephen Kwan had a ground ball double that snuck its way into the outfield. Neither of those were hard-hit balls. It was just a really, really tough inning for Perez. And again, he's not really missing bats still, and that's still an issue, but I don't want to chalk it all up to just bad CNL Perez. And then things just went to disaster mode. Mike Bauman came in second and third with one out. It's a 3 nothing game. O's are still in it. Infield's in. Bauman gets the ground ball to Frazier that he wants. Frazier double clutches, then makes a horrendous throw to the plate. One hops it, skips by McCann. Nobody's backing up home. Two runs score on the error, and all of a sudden it's 5 nothing, and the game's out of control. 
just kind of a tough inning to watch where the Orioles unraveled there in the seventh. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from this one is worse than anything I just talked about in that 5 nothing loss. It's that Cedric Mullins left the game with an injury in the eighth inning, running down the line, pulls up, and comes out of the game. And everyone holding their collective breaths, knowing how bad it would be for the Orioles to lose Cedric Mullins. Well, coming up next, I'll get you the latest update on the Mullins injury, how much time he could miss, and who could replace him out there in center field and on the roster if he does have to miss some extended time here in May and June, and hopefully not, but potentially more for the Orioles. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now new customers can get a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's right, $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Now, if I was given a chance to get this bet, make this bet right now, I'd go Nuggets in the NBA Finals. But the great thing about FanDuel is they've got all the lines, all the odds you need. Plus, the app is so, so easy to use. And it makes you sign in every time. And it's very safe, very secure with your money. And you get paid instantly. There is no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. So the Orioles fall 5-0 to the Cleveland Guardians on Monday in game one of a three-game series. But although it was one of the worst played games of the year by the Orioles, that itself, the result of the game, was not the worst thing that happened on Monday. The worst thing by far that happened was that Cedric Mullins left this game with an injury. In the eighth inning of this one with the O's trailing 5-0, Mullins hits a ground ball the other way to shortstop. Looked like he was going to beat it out easily, and then about two steps from the bag, he pulls up, starts limping, grabs kind of the upper part of his right leg, slows down completely, and gets thrown out at first to add literally insult to injury. Came out of the game as, as Brandon Hyde and the athletic training staff came out, and Mullins left almost immediately right there. Well, we didn't have to wait long. It was the eighth inning of the injury. We get the news after the game from Brandon Hyde. They're calling it a right adductor slash groin strain, which kind of similar areas of injury there and an injury that baseball players will get from time to time. But it is tough news. Brandon Hyde said, you know, not at all what you want to hear. Kind of said it about losing Mullins, but also about the severity of the injury because this isn't going to be a day-to-day -day thing. I think we haven't heard anything specific yet. You know, the O's are most likely going to make a move at some point today, but at the very least, it sounds like he's going on the 10-day injured list at the very least. And if you look at these injuries to other players, he's probably going to go on for more time than that. Now, I wanted to look at just position players who have had a similar groin strain. And there's just different stages. There's grade one, grade two, and grade three. So we kind of have to wait to see how bad the strain is. But there were three kind of main cases of this injury last year. Now, there's been one case so far this year. It's Anthony Rendon. He suffered the injury on May 15th. He is still not back for the Angels here 15 days later. And there hasn't been an update really on his condition. So that's one bullet point to look at. Two weeks and still no rehab games or anything for Anthony Rendon. Now, Rendon, not as good an athlete as Mullins, not in as good a shape. He's a little older than Cedric Mullins as well. But there were three guys last year, and all guys who their speed is a part of their game, and all guys who are pretty athletic guys as well. Aledemus Diaz, Luis Guillorme, and John Birdie. Now, all infielders, of course, but still all had this similar injury last year all missed about a month with the adductor slash groin strain last year. So I am not a doctor, and I am not going to say that Mullins is out for a month, but if you compare it to what just in 2022 position player, now a lot more pitchers got this injury last year, but that's a weird comparison. So I compared it to position players, and it seemed like right around a month, they kind of give guys three to five weeks, and they generally come back in about a month. Not saying that's what's going to happen to Mullins. We want to wait for that official word. And if it's really severe, guys get surgery, but generally it doesn't require surgery. It's just rest and then rehab and getting back on the field. But I, right now, the head space that I'm in with the Mullins injury is expecting him to be out for about a month. And that is not good news for the Orioles because Mullins has been 
awesome this year. I would argue that despite the Orioles pitching woes and despite how good Tyler Wells has been and how, you know, at times good Kyle Gibson has been, how you could say, you know, the Orioles already sent down Grayson Rodriguez. If they were to lose another starting pitcher due to injury, that'd be catastrophic. I think we'd all agree that the number one guy who you would least like to get injured, who would blow up the team the most, would be Adley Rutschman getting injured. That would be the worst case scenario. I would argue that number two on that list, who you'd least like to lose to injury in this Orioles season, is Cedric Mullins. That's how good he's been. 263 average, 356 on base, 479 slug, eight homers, 39 RBIs to lead the team, 13 stolen bases to lead the team, 12% walk rate on the year, a 133 WRC plus, meaning he's been 33% better than a league average hitter. That was right around what he was when he was an all-star in terms of WRC plus in 2021. Already worth almost two wins via war on fan graphs because the defense has been so good as well in center field. He's hitting lefties a lot better this year. That's why the offensive numbers are up from 2022. And he's playing basically every day for the O's. He's been so important to this team. I would rank him number two behind Adley Rutschman among importance to this 2023 Orioles team. And I get that in the grand scheme of things, you know, you got a five to six month season. One month isn't terrible to miss. But you're talking about 25-plus baseball games where the Orioles could be without Cedric Mullins. And when you are fighting in a really, really tough American League and an even tougher AL East, you can't be losing one of your most important players. But that's what's happening right here. And again, hopefully the diagnosis for Mullins is better than some of those other guys that I just mentioned. But my current expectation is Mullins out for a month. And, And that is bad, bad news for the Orioles at this point. So whether he's out for 10 days, you know, maybe it's a quick injury, two weeks or a month or more, we still have to answer the question, what do the Orioles do both in center field and with that open roster spot in the meantime, if he does in fact go on the injured list. So coming up next to finish off the pod, going to take a look at really the three main options for the Orioles in terms of who they could call up to take his place and then what the domino effect in the outfield would be if any of those three guys came up or came back up to the big league roster. So the big news of the day for the Orioles, even though they did lose it 5-0 to the Guardians, even worse was losing Cedric Mullins to injury. As I mentioned, groin strain generally for guys, it looks like about a month that they miss. That's what it could be. Not saying that's what it will be, but that's what it could be for Cedric Mullins. The next obvious question is whether it's a week, two weeks, 30 days, two months, Who replaces him? He's been so good. 133 WRC+, plus, been amazing in center field. How do you replace a guy that good? Well, I think the first name that your mind goes to is, well, the Orioles have Colton Kowser. He can play center field. He's a left-handed hitter. He's one of their top prospects. He's in AAA. That would be the perfect fit. Well, here's the issue. Colton Kowser is still currently on the injured list. He's been there for a few weeks right now, and... He's also got a leg injury at the moment. Now, Mike Elias did say on Friday that Kowser is pretty close to coming back. It sounded like he might even be back at some point this week. But when a guy's coming back from an injury and he still hasn't played a crazy amount of games at AAA, I can't imagine the Orioles are going to take Kowser right off that AAA injured list and just immediately send him up to the big leagues. At the very least, he might rehab in Aberdeen or Bowie and then play some games in AAA before they would think about it. Now. If the Mullins injury is long-term, like a month or more, Kowser could eventually be the replacement. Once he's back and healthy, he's played in some more games in the minors, and he's ready to go. That could certainly be the case. But right now, that's not the fill-in. Now, the other outfielder your mind would go right to is, oh, Kyle Stowers. He's been in the big leagues multiple different times this year. He was in the big leagues last year. Yeah, he's not a center fielder, but he helps you with outfield. Well, Kyle Stowers is also on the injured list in Norfolk with some shoulder inflammation. We haven't gotten as positive an update on him from Mike Elias, so we really don't know. So for now, Stowers is out of the question as well. So then you go down the list. And in terms of outfielders left in AAA, the next one would be Hudson Haskin. He's also on the injured list. Now, Haskin last week did play in rehab games in Aberdeen, so he will most likely be joining the Norfolk Tides back in AAA this week but he needs to place way more in AAA before he's ready for the big leagues at all. And then the other guys, you know, Shane Fontana, I don't think he's the guy. Ben Deluzio, who did spend a little time in the big leagues with the Cardinals last year, but can't hit. He's a defense first guy. And the Orioles just signed him last week 
for depth on a minor league deal. I kind of think the only outfield option you really have in AAA, because yes, I love Heston Kerstad, but they are not calling him up from AA to the big leagues right now. That's not happening. Your option, if you want to go outfielder, I think is Daz Cameron. Now, in terms of defensively, Cameron is a good fit. He's been in the big leagues before for the last couple of seasons, mostly with Detroit. And he's a really great defensive center fielder. He's got speed as well, right-handed hitter, so a little different than Mullins. But you would lose maybe a half a step, but you wouldn't lose much defensively putting Cameron in center field for a bit while Mullins is out. That would be the one good thing about calling up Daz Cameron. Now, the Orioles claimed him off waivers this offseason, then DFA'd him, then kept him in the organization. So he's currently not on the 40-man roster, but the Orioles do have one open spot on the 40-man at the moment. So they could really call up anyone because they wouldn't have to make a 40-man move. So Cameron could be that guy. Now, I will say he's been solid in AAA at the plate. Not amazing, but in 159 plate appearances with the Norfolk Tides this season, 267 average, 358 on base, 481 slugging. He's got seven homers. He's stolen 10 bases. And a 109 WRC plus means he's been 9% better than a AAA hitter. That's nothing amazing. 21% strikeout rate's a little high. 10% walk rate's pretty solid for the center fielder Cameron. But you do have to note that he has been in the big leagues before, specifically, again, the last couple of years with the Detroit Tigers. He's played great defense in center field. He hasn't hit. 244 career big league plate appearances just a 67 WRC plus and a 201 batting average for Cameron. So that's kind of the issue with calling up Cameron, right? Because if you want the good defense to stay and you want to just replace Mullins with another true center fielder, Daz Cameron's the easy move right here. But you cannot put Cameron's bat in the order every day. You just can't do it, all right? That's going to pull down an offense that's already, as I mentioned already in this episode, struggling at the moment. So if you did go with Cameron, it would probably be some sort of mixing and matching in center field between Daz Cameron, Ryan McKenna, and Austin Hayes. Now, here's the dilemma you put yourself in there, right? Your best two, your defensive options in center field, going by just pure defense, Cameron would be one, McKenna two, Hayes three. But the offense-wise would be reverse order. Hayes one, probably McKenna two, and Cameron three. They're all right-handed hitters as well, and so that gives you kind of a platoon disadvantage at this point. And McKenna, I do not want him hitting righties. I really don't want Cameron hitting against righties either. I'm totally fine. I mean, Austin Hayes is now going to definitely play every day, although he was already hitting over 300. But that's kind of how you would maneuver it. You would call up Cameron. You would split the time in center. When Cameron or McKenna would be in center field, you'd have Hayes in left. If you did start Hayes in center, that's also where things get tough who you put in left field because it's tough to play left field out here right now at Camden Yards, but that's where we kind of get to with the next option. But if you do go Cameron, it's maybe a Taron Vavra, Adam Frazier kind of situation in left field because I don't think if you start McKenna or Cameron, I don't think you would put him in left field. I would have to think they would be in center and you would put Hayes in left. But there's two more options, I think, for the call up here. And they would both be infielders because, again, as I said, Daz Cameron, pretty much the one option for an outfielder. So option number two, the first infield option, would be to recall Joey Ortiz. Now, Ortiz was just sent down a couple of days ago on Friday when Arias was activated off the injured list. But because he would be replacing a player in Mullins going on to the IL, he would be allowed to be recalled within the 10-day minimum that usually is the case for getting recalled back to the big leagues. Now, Ortiz, as you know, Not an outfielder. Does not play the outfield, only plays the infield. But hit 259 is 28 plate appearances in the big league so far this year. 120 WRC plus in AAA. Continues to hit well down there. And you could still make things work because A, it would give you another option to replace Jorge Mateo as he struggles. Heck, you could go with an Ortiz at shortstop, Frazier at second, Henderson at third infield for a while because Arias still doesn't look 100% healthy and Mateo still can't hit in the month of May. So you could do that for a bit if you called up Ortiz. But the other thing you could do is you kind of split time between McKenna and Hayes in center field. When McKenna's in center, Hayes in left. When Hayes is in center, you could put Taron Vavra in left field. He's not amazing out there, but he's done it before, even with the the new ballpark or the, the new wall, at least, at Camden Yards. He's still patrolled it out there, and Vavra is pretty much an outfielder at this point. And Adam Frazier has played the outfield a little bit, and he can do it. 
And I would trust him at least enough early in a game to play left field. And then for both of those guys, you could bring in McKenna later as a defensive replacement. In right field, you're probably going to see Anthony Santander every single day out there now. Like there's not going to be much DHing left for Santander. You could see some, you know, if McKenna is in center, maybe Hayes in left, you could see some Vavra in right a little bit, some Frazier in right in that scenario. You could see even a little Ryan O'Hearn in right field. He's done it a little bit. He's still on the roster. He can play the corner outfield. He might see a little outfield time at this point. That is if the O's go with the infield option to add another infielder in Ortiz. Now, I would say there's one more option here, and that would be Jordan Westberg. Now, Westberg, again, Ortiz is already on the 40-man, so he comes right up. Westberg, like Daz Cameron, would have to be added to the 40-man roster, but there is an open spot, so it would be pretty easy. And Westberg, one of the Orioles' top prospects, they would like another good bat in the lineup. He seems to be that, hitting 311, 13 homers, a 142 WRC plus in AAA so far this season. He's well over 500 AAA plate appearances, well past the threshold that most other guys who have been called up have hit already. And I know he's not an outfielder, but he has played a little outfield in the minors in AAA with the O's just to up his versatility for whenever he got called up. I would not put him in left field at Camden Yards right now, but I might put him in right field for a bit. I would put him in left field in a different ballpark with a shorter fence out there where left field's like the easiest position on the field, and he could play a little infield. So if you went with that, you could kind of do like a straight haze in center field almost every day. McKenna could spell him a little bit. In left field, you'd go with Taryn Vavra out there, maybe a little Adam Frazier. And then in right field, Santander, O'Hearn, and Westberg could be an option as well. Now, the thing that's going to happen to the O's no matter what, unless they call up Daz Cameron and play him almost every day, they're going to take a step back defensively in the outfield. It's just going to happen 100%. You're going to see more Santander and less Mullins and some Hayes in center. All of that means worse defensive outfield, no question about it. But with mixing and matching between Hayes and McKenna and Vavra and Frazier and O'Hearn and Santander and potentially Westberg and Daz Cameron, I think you can find a way to have it be a playable defensive outfield until Mullins gets back. But, you know, I'm talking about all these scenarios. And even if Westberg does come up, I don't know if he's in there every day. Like he's going to be in some sort of platoon. He's going to be moving around. That may not be the best fit for him for his first call up at this point. So if I had to guess, I think they might actually go Ortiz initially, kind of work things out in the outfield, see how it's going. And then if defensively it's really going poorly, or if McKenna's just not hitting at all, I think they could flip-flop it and go with Daz Cameron. So we'll see what they do. And then Westberg would maybe be that third option. There's also the option of going out and getting somebody for a bit, maybe off waivers or a minor league signing or a, a minor trade. That could happen too. You know, I mean, heck, going to get like a Brett Phillips type just to play him out there a little bit. Wouldn't love that because Daz Cameron can kind of do the same thing. He's a very good defender too, but that could happen. It's just going to be tough until Kowser is healthy and ready to go. If Mullins is out for an extended time, that time between either Mullins coming back or if Mullins is out for a while, Kowser being ready to go, it's going to be tough for a bit defensively in the outfield. Just have that be known. Now, Can the offense pick it up? Yes, especially if Ortiz comes back or if it's Westberg or if maybe O'Hearn plays more and really starts to swing it or we see Vavra get hot. He's getting more at bats and Austin Hayes is, you know, maybe he's loving it out there in center and the bat stays hot. But all in all, it is to say this is a really tough loss for the Orioles, a loss they did not need in Cedric Mullins, but they're going to be without Cedric for a little bit here. Hopefully it's not too long, but it's going to be a little bit. And he's going to, you know, he's going to get further testing. We're really going to see what this injury is. But right now, the O's are really going to have to find a way to pull through this one. And and that's going to start coming up tonight. Game two of three between the Orioles and the Guardians, a 7.05 p.m. Eastern time start. Cal Quantrill will go for the Guardians. Not a strikeout guy. Throws a sinker, a four-seamer, a cutter, a two-seamer. Just throws a whole bunch of different fastballs at you. Tries to just like hit the corners of the zone at all times. The right-hander has a 4.75 ERA in 55 innings this year, but only 31 strikeouts in that time. His last start against the White Sox was not good. Four innings, six runs, four hits, two Ks, three walks. Hopefully the Orioles can do that to him. And on the other side, it'll be Kyle Gibson coming off a great start against the Yankees. See if he can continue to do that. 
against the Guardians. And you can catch every pitch of the Orioles' hometown broadcast of tonight's Game 2 with the Sirius XM app. That is the SXM app. Just go to the app and search Orioles. And then I'll be back with you here tomorrow on the pod, recapping Game 2 between the Orioles and the Guardians and getting you more information about what the deal is with this Cedric Mullins groin injury. But until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.